um, based on the participation, it's a good topic or a, a very good speaker. And I think it's probably both. So <laughs> thank, you, right. well, thank you. Thank you, Trent. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I am. Um, I've been surveying for almost 50 years now. I grew up on a dairy farm, uh, left the farm to join the Marines. The Marines were kind enough, uh, although that's hard to say about the Marines, but they were kind enough not to send me to Vietnam, but instead, instead sent me to surveying school. Uh, and I spent the next four years surveying all over the, the world, came back, worked for a small land surveying firm, uh, actually got licensed based on experience. And then I decided to go to college and uh, stayed in college and got my bachelor's uh, in civil engineering, master's in surveying and photogrammetry, uh, PhD in civil engineering, and then a law degree. So I am a um, licensed surveyor in six states or have been anyway, uh, a professional engineer in several and an attorney at law. Most, most of my work now, I am retired. I taught at the University of Maine for close to 30 years in the surveying program. Most of my work now is dealing with uh, legal issues, boundaries, easements happens to be one uh, litigation. I've been both the attorney uh, in litigation, I've appealed cases up to the main Supreme Court. I've also been an expert witness numerous times. So I've been a um, arbitrator, uh, a mediator, uh, a commissioner for county boundaries. So I have quite a bit of uh, experience in different aspects. So I'm happy to share that with all of you. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get on the chat box and ask them while I'm presenting. Tonight, we're going to be talking about prescriptive easements and the land surveyor. And as an overview, the doctrine of prescription allows a adverse user, one without permission from the record owner, to gain a lawful easement across somebody's property without their permission, uh, so long as they've met certain minimum requirements that are set by each state. Now, every state allows a prescriptive easement. The requirements for gaining a prescriptive easement, I would say about are about 80% the same. Uh, there are little differences, especially with the statute of limitations that we're going to talk about between states. So if you are interested in this topic a little more, just get on your state uh, legislative website where the statutes are and just see what the statute of limitations is for real property. And that will be the statute of limitations that we're going to talk about later. Before we get into easements, I just want to mention that there are at least, uh, I would classify as four different types of easements that you as a land surveyor will or could encounter in your practice that are not reflected in the records and yet are legal easements. Uh, tonight, we're going to just talk about one of those, a prescriptive easement, but actually some of the implied easements are much easier to obtain than a prescriptive easement. And you always want to, uh, I guess, be cognizant of the different ways to acquire an easement and then be on the lookout uh, for those easements or evidence of those easements when you're surveying property. By the way, the handouts, I think if you check the chat, there's a drop box. If for some reason that doesn't work for you, uh, just go ahead and email me. Uh, my email's right there on the, the cover, so write that down. And for some reason you can't get the handouts to the drop box, just email me and I'll send you a, a copy of those. All right, we've got to talk about some terms in order for me to advance 
this topic of prescriptive easements. Two terms that are common with all easements is the dominant tenement or estate and the servient tenement or the estate. The dominant tenement is the party or the property that has the right to use the easement. The servient tenement is the property that is burdened by the easement, all right? So the dominant tenement is the person or the property. And I'm gonna explain that distinction that has the right to use the easement. And the servient tenement is the property that is burdened by the easement. Now the easement itself, and the, the term easement is a right to use the property of someone else. All right, so an easement is defined as the right to use the property of someone else. Now there is what's called a negative easement, which doesn't necessarily give a person the right to use somebody else's property, but it does give that person the right to control somebody's use of their property. And normally a covenant, many covenants can be termed as a negative easement. Well, I mentioned covenants. Let's explain what a covenant is. A covenant is a promise respecting property, all right? So a covenant is promise respecting a property. So let me give you an example of a covenant. Some of you that have prepared subdivision plans have no doubt seen covenants. Uh, one covenant might be that you can't put manufactured housing on a lot or no outside animals or no farm animals or houses have to be uh, built a certain way. Those are all promises that the buyer of that property, by buying the property and accepting the deed, binds themselves to those promises. All right, so that's a covenant. So we're talking about easements tonight, a prescriptive easement. All right, we just talked about the terms that I'm going to be using it. Now we're going to talk about um, two different ways to classify an easement. There are more than two ways to classify an easement, by the way. But the two ways we're going to talk about have an impact on the prescriptive easement. One way to classify an easement, not just a prescriptive easement, but any easement, is whether the easement is a pertinent easement or an easement in gross. And a pertinent easement is an easement that belongs to the property itself. It's attached to the property. It can exist without the dominant property. It has to have that. Most of you would uh, could visualize in a pertinent easement when you think of a, a access right away from the public road back to a piece of property. That access right away, and by the way, the term right away is often treated as synonymous with an easement. However, modern practice has sort of bastardized that expression right away to sometimes include fee simple ownership of a strip of land. For example, a lot of times we'll refer to a power line right away or a railroad right away when in fact these entities may own that strip of land in fee simple, all right? So I might use the term right away, but the right away term right away would include easements, but it may also include fee simple title. All right, so to again, go back to visualizing this pertinent 
easement. It's uh, that access easement that provides access to a back uh, property that's not bordered by a public road. And in order to access that property, you leave the public road and drive back on this a pertinent easement. The other half of this classification is an easement and gross. Uh, easement and gross is not a pertinent to a property. It's, it's the dominant estate is actually a dominant person. A person owns or gets to use the property of another in the form of an easement. Most easements, I've, I've sometimes polled my students as to which is more common, a pertinent easements or easements in gross, and most students would choose a, a pertinent easement. When in fact, most easements that exist out there are easements in gross. Um, a common easement in gross is a power line. Uh, many public roads are easements in gross. They're easements. They don't attach to or benefit any particular piece of property. They're owned by a person, in this case, the person being a municipality. Uh, but power lines, gas lines, railroads, sewer lines, water lines, their um, drainage, uh, all these typically are easements in gross. And so when you think about that, you realize that most easements that you encounter as a surveyor will be easements in gross. All right, so that's one way to classify easements. Another way to classify easements are whether it's a public or a private easement. Most of you, if I didn't explain any more, you would be able to, I think, uh, apply a definition off the top of your head and you'd probably be right. A public easement uh, is where the public at large can use the easement, does use the easement and so on. A private easement is limited to, uh, in the case of a pertinent easement to those that are own the property or are visiting the property or in the case of a private easement, is a very limited number of people that can use it. The public as a whole can't. You might have private easements, let's say, um, in a gated community or a condominium where only the members of the condominium can, let's say, uh, park in a certain area or uh, use a boat launch or something like that, that would be considered a private easement. And there sometimes are different requirements. In order to gain access or an easement by prescription, depending upon whether it's the public that that prescriptive easement is going to benefit versus a uh, private party that's going to benefit. Now, we're going to go through some elements that have to be met in order for the user to gain an easement across somebody's property without their permission. I'm going to go through these elements. But I want to make it very clear, as I did in the uh, talk a couple weeks ago about adverse possession. I am not here to train you for you to make a decision whether a client has a prescriptive easement or not. I would, as an attorney at law, never, ever tell a client they have a prescriptive right. I don't care if they've used that road for 40 years. I would never, ever 
counsel them and say, you have a prescriptive easement. There is just too much uncertainty in both a prescriptive easement and adverse possession for me to make that claim. Think of it this way. You know somebody, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's one of your children, and you look at them and they appear healthy. No coughs, no temperature, um, no symptoms of any uh, disease or flu or anything. And you might be able to say, you know what? You're going to live another five years. But we know better. There's a lot of ways. And unfortunately, there's a lot of ways for young people and even older people to die in the next 10 minutes. And that's how it is with, I think, prescriptive easement and adverse possession. There's just too many unknowns out there. So who gets to make the decision? A judge or the record owner? That's the only two ways. You can be absolute certainty that the prescriptive easement has ripened into a surefire easement is have the record owner acknowledge that the easement exists or have a judge declare that the easement exists. An attorney shouldn't, I don't. And I don't think it's a good idea for the surveyor to tell their client, oh yeah, you have a prescriptive easement. Now there's nothing wrong with telling the client that based upon what you say, there's a good chance they have a prescriptive easement or even flip side that the neighbor or somebody else may have a prescriptive easement on your client's property. But don't be certain. That's all I'm warning you against, even though I'm gonna teach you the elements. And you'll have mo more knowledge by knowing these elements than most attorneys practicing law. Don't make that leap. It just exposes you to liability that you don't need to have as a surveyor. All right, so what are these elements? First of all, there has to be actual use. That persons or persons are actually using this property. They're driving across it. Maybe they got a power line across it. Um, maybe their septic field is on the neighbor's pro uh, property, but they're using that. They're using somebody else's property without their permission or without a legal right. There's no implied easement, in other words. They, they have no legal right to be using this person's property, yet they are. They don't just draw up a deed that says, I have an easement. They actually are using somebody else's property without that permission. The use has to be open and notorious use. Now, just like adverse possession, the use must be of such a nature that the record owner would be put on notice that there's use by somebody else. The record owner though, can't close their eyes and stop or their ears and say, but I never knew they were using my land. They always use the back part. I'm old, I can't walk back there. I never saw that old road that's being used by my neighbor crossing my property. I physically could never get back there. I could never see it. It doesn't matter. The question is, would a reasonable person 
have seen this use. Not that that particular landowner saw it, but a reasonable person treating their property as every other person should, would they have picked up on that use? If so, it was open and notorious. Third element, was the use hostile? Did the dominant estate, the user, were they using this without permission of the record owner? If they ever had permission, then permission is presumed to have continued. So if 100 years ago, the owner of the servient property had given somebody permission to use to, to cross their property to access their land, even though there's different owners of both the appurtenant property and the servient property, the use is presumed to have continued. And again, it's one of those things that as a surveyor, we don't do all that digging. In fact, uh, the only time I do that kind of digging where I'm looking back over previous owners is when I got to litigate the case. Then I might find it, the previous owners try to contact them. Did you ever give permission for this person to use the property and so on? Surveyors, we don't do that. That's a hostile use. It's got to be a hostile use. There has to be a claim of right. And the claim of right is simply the acquiescence of the servient estate to that. When I say acquiescence, again, it's not that they had to actually see it, but they didn't do anything to stop it. They didn't block it. And it's not good enough, by the way, for the Serbian estate to simply say, don't use that road anymore. It's not good enough for the Serbian estate to put survey pins to show the user that they're trespassing. The Serbian estate must block the use. So we have claim of right and we have record title acquiescence, which sort of goes together. Both are generally presumed. I don't usually have to prove this if I'm representing a client that's claiming a prescriptive easement. When I say I don't have to prove it, I don't have to be very specific and prove it. Usually when you prove all the others, actual, open, notorious, hostile, uh, and there was no blocking, the presumption is it was also done with the acquiescence of the record title owner. The use has to be continuous. Now, mind you, when I say continuous, it doesn't have to occur every second of every minute of every hour of every day of, every, of the year. It occurs whenever the dominant estate so desires to do it. I've seen prescriptive easements for like hunting camps, where the only time the dominant estate used it was during hunting season, maybe two or three weeks out of the entire year. But they used it when they wanted to. They didn't go up in the middle of the summer because it wasn't hunting season. They didn't go out in the spring because there was no hunting season. They just used that road during hunting season. And that's the continuous use. Now I would suggest that if they didn't use it enough that the use wasn't visible anymore, wasn't open and notorious, 
then it probably wouldn't be continuous. If, however, the serving estate had blocked that use for one of the hunting seasons, then the person would have to start all over with their statutory period of time. So let me give you um, a little story. Uh, I went to Penn State and in Pennsylvania, the statute of limitations is 21 years. And we're gonna to get to the statute of limitations, um, but just keep that in mind, 21 years. Well, every 20 years, just to be sure, the campus police would block every road going into Penn State. They would put barriers across the road. And you'd come thinking you're gonna to go to college that day, you're probably a typical student, you're running real late and all of a sudden there's a barrier. And there's a campus police uh, person right there. So it's not like you can sneak around, drive on the grass, you stop. Campus um, police come up to you and say, uh, what's your business? Well, I got class, I'm gonna be late. I, I need to get on, uh, on the campus. Would you like permission to drive on the road? Well, yes, let me on. Okay, and they'd move the barrier and that person would drive on. And most students said, this is stupid. Why are they doing this? They're doing it so the public doesn't get an easement on every street on the campus. They want to keep those roads private. They only belong to Penn State, not the public at large. Penn State wants to be able to control who goes on the road. That's why they don't want the public to gain a prescriptive easement. So they, may, they block the road just one day. And the only way you're gonna get on is if you ask permission and it's given. And that's all they have to do because now there's no continuous use and the public has to start all over to try to gain their 21 years to get on campus and make that the campus roads a public road. All right, the other, next element, it has to be in the same location. So if you're driving across somebody's field to get to your land, and you deviate across the breadth of the field, you know, one month you're using the western part of the field, on the other month you might use the eastern part. Uh, maybe it gets a little muddy over there, so you switch over in the middle of the field until that gets muddy, and then you switch over to the far left portion of the field. You're not going to get a prescriptive easement. It has to be in the same location. Not that you can't deviate a little, a couple feet here, a couple feet there, but you can't deviate significant. It's not gonna be in the same location and therefore that's gonna defeat the prescriptive easements. Now I've mentioned statutory periods several times. All these elements that I've been speaking about has to occur for the statutory period. And this varies by state. For example, some of the states I uh, licensed in, uh, Maine, it's 20 years, Pennsylvania, it's 21 years, Florida, it's seven years, West Virginia, it's 10 years. You see how it differs? between the states, you know, 20 and 21 years, that's a long time. On the other hand, seven years, um, 10 years, not so much. Big difference between states. And sometimes it differs between a prescriptive easement for the public versus a prescriptive easement for a private person. The statutory period varies depending upon whether it's a public prescriptive easement or a private prescriptive easement.
All right, another thing to look out for is as a general, and this is not uh, true for every state, but the Serbian estate has to be a private party. You can't gain a prescriptive easement on the public, certainly not the federal government. So you can't go uh, drive across a national forest for 40 years and meet all the elements of a prescriptive easement and gain a prescriptive easement because it's public land. that you're gaining or trying to gain a prescriptive easement on. In other words, it's the public that owns that serving estate. You will not be, when I say you, the a pertinent property or the user will not be able to get a prescriptive easement on the government. Some states do allow a prescriptive easements against the municipality or the railroads or uh, some other quasi public entity. Some states do allow prescriptive easement. I'd say most states do not. And the final consideration, this isn't necessarily an element, but the final consideration is that you can't gain a prescriptive easement for lighter air. Many landowners are very disappointed about that. They build this nice little um, house on a mountain or on a hillside that has this beautiful view of the mountains or a lake or the um, water, ocean, bay, whatever and they love it. And then the neighbor goes and builds a high rise that blocks their view. And it's been litigated many times. I've had my house there for 40 years and looked at that beautiful mountain until this neighbor built the house. I have a prescriptive easement, um, uh, an easement across that land so I can maintain the view. No, you don't get a prescriptive easement for light or air or a view. That has to be an express easement in order for that to work. All right, let's talk about extinguishing a prescriptive easement. So let's say that there is an easement, it's been created or appears to have been created by prescription. Maybe it hasn't gone to court, but there's a good case for a prescriptive easement. How can we get rid of that? Well, one way is for the dominant estate to give a release or quick claim deed to the servient estate. You say, well, why would they do that, Canute? I've had it happen or uh, overseen this happen many times. And the easiest way to get rid of it is to offer another one. Right? I mean, it, here we have... Uh, I'm representing a client and it looks like there may be a prescriptive easement across their property. They don't wanna fight it, but they don't want the use right there. They have plans for that use. And so I can go to the so-called dominant estate and say, listen, uh, my client wants to develop the property, needs that place where you have your road. Uh, you don't have any written easement for that road. My client will give you an express easement, making your title marketable. If you'll release any rights that you may have accrued by a prescriptive easement. 
And many times they say, sure, sounds like a, a good plan. I get a definite legal right to my property in exchange for uh, giving up any rights that I may have accrued by prescription. So many times I've um, prepared release deeds to extinguish a prescriptive easement. Non-use for a sufficient time period to satisfy what's known as equity. Equity is a bunch of uh, principles uh, that I don't even want to venture down at this point in time. But if a person hasn't used a prescriptive easement for such a long period of time that maybe the use disappears. Let me back up and just make sure everybody will follow what I'm saying. Let's say between 1890 in 1930, somebody used a road across somebody's property to access their property. They didn't have a right to use that road. They used it and met all the elements of prescription in that 30 year period, right? 18, actually 40 years, 1890 to 1930, 40 years, they met every element but since 1930 they've never used it the road has overgrown you can't even see it anymore uh, new owners have bought the surveying property they had surveyors survey the property no surveyor picked up on any adverse use um, a long period of time 60, 70, 80 years has gone by without any use. Now think about what's happened. Somebody, let's say they could prove that between 1890 and 1930, they met all the elements of, of prescription. They could prove every one of those elements. But since then, there's been no use. The courts would balance the equity and say, I'm sorry, you lost the right. It's not fair for a new owner who's done a research of the records, didn't find an easement, went out to the site, didn't see any visible use of that easement. Historically or at present, uh, we're just not going to burden them with an easement. You should have used it in the Sixty some years. You did. Equity says you can't. Third way to extinguish that prescriptive easement is you block it. You block it for a sufficient period of time. Typically, if you acquired the prescriptive easement by 10 years, and somebody then later blocks it for 10 years, it's gone. By the way, you could do that with any easement. If the statute of limitations in your state is let's say it's 10 years and you, your client or somebody else blocks your client's easement for 10 years so that they can't and didn't use it. That easement gone, not that you decide on that surveyor. I like to call that as reverse prescription. Got a, a chat here, let me just read that. I always like questions. Uh, I know a doctor now deceased that lived in the Presidio of San Diego overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Neighbors blow him, allowed their trees to grow and block the ocean view of the doctor's property. The doctor sued, claiming his rights to a viewscape 
to the ocean and the downhill neighbor had to trim the top of his cre uh, trees. Could this fuscape have been part of a subdivision covenant? Probably, it could be. And if you're doing a um, subdivision where your the selling point is the view, make sure you do put covenants that preserve the view. Now there is another aspect that I haven't talked about this session that's worth mentioning now. We've gone through some rules and we still have some to go through. But there are two rules that trump every rule there is. These two, two true two rules that I'm going to cover trump the rules of construction. In other words, we were taught that the position of the original monument cited in the operative deeds controls over measurements and area. We know that as surveyors, that's like the main rule that we operate under. These two rules trump that rule. They don't teach these rules in law school. But every lawyer, I've been practicing law for almost 40 years now. Every lawyer that's practiced as long as I have knows about these two rules. And if they're good lawyers, they'll tell their client about these two rules. So now you're asking, what are these two rules? If you were here last time, you know. The first rule is this. It is better to know the judge than the law. Let me repeat that. It is better to know the judge than the law. I have lots of stories. We don't have time. Where I have seen this happen in the courtroom. When I discovered that one of the parties was friends with the judge, I knew what the result was. I don't care what the law is. I know what the result's gonna be. Be nice if I get the judge to recuse herself or himself, that's not always possible. It's just how it is. The second rule is you can get as much justice as you can afford. Now, I know that's very cynical. And I know that runs counter to what you'd like to believe that the American justice system is. But it's a fact that I've had to sit down many times with the clients, tell them that rule. I say, you get as much justice as you can afford. And frankly, I don't think you can afford much justice. I have to sit down and tell a client that in order to litigate a boundary dispute, it's gonna be at least $40,000. If they don't have $40,000, I don't care how right they are, you shouldn't be going to court. Now, some of you are old enough to remember O.J. Simpson trial, the murder trial, not the civil case, but the murder trial. Is there any doubt that if O.J. Simpson was some black man from the hood, that he wouldn't be sitting in jail for murder? Come on. He was a wealthy man, hired the best lawyers, and he got off. You get as much justice as you can afford. So I'm looking at this, and he says, a doctor. Well, doctors can typically afford a lot of justice. And if the owner down the slope from him couldn't afford much justice, eh, that's just how it is. I'm sorry. 
All right, back on to prescription and how to extinguish it. The fourth method I have there is abandonment of prescription. You abandon the prescriptive use in favor of another use. Where do you see that? If you practice surveying, you've seen this with the public right away, right? The, the public comes along and they want to straighten out, a, let's say, a bad curve in the road. So they condemn some land and they build a new portion of the road. And the old portion of the road where the bad curve is doesn't get used anymore. Many times I've had to litigate that and a judge says, look at the, the DOT or the municipality has abandoned the old portion. They should have had some writing that did it, a release deed to that landowner, something like that, but they didn't. If they're no longer using it, the presumption is that they abandoned the old in favor of the new. And many of these old roads you can't find any record of them. They're clearly a public prescriptive easement. They might have been an old uh, Indian path that was then uh, enlarged to take wagons. And now in modern day, it's a paved highway. And you as a surveyor have looked all over for the records for that particular public road and you can't find it. It's clearly a prescriptive easement. It's clearly a prescriptive easement. You can, the landowner can argue they probably won't win, saying there's no records, the road was never condemned, taken or whatever, but it's been used for 300 years as a public road. Uh, it's without question going to be presumed to be a pres public prescriptive easement. Now there's problems with that that we're going to get into, but I'm just mentioning that many of our public roads are based on prescription, long use, open, notorious, continuous, hostile, whatever, all the elements of that, and then they the municipality does create a new section or the DOT creates a new section, that old section is presumed to have been abandoned. That prescriptive easement is now presumed to be abandoned. Obviously, the dominant estate can go and say, I don't want that road anymore and can just declare it abandoned. There's no records for it, so they can just say, to the serving estate, I don't need that road. And so-called abandoned. So what's our role as a surveyor? Right, you know the elements. And I've warned you against saying it's definitely a prescriptive easement or it's definitely not a prescriptive easement. You always remember those two overriding rules. You want to locate the use, any use that's inconsistent with the ownership, power lines crossing the property, um, roads, driveways that cut the corner of your client's property. You want to uh, um, locate that, identify it, maybe even describe it. Put it on the plat. And then you want to communicate the potential adverse use to the client, whether it's for the client's benefit or against the client, just let them know. And always explain the ramifications of adverse use to the client. It's not good enough. You probably have an hour session on how to write a CYA note a good one, but it's never good enough to simply tell the client, oh, by the way, your neighbor's using 
the driveway is cutting across the corner of your property or, or the neighbor's power lines uh, overhead uh, cutting across the corner of your property. That is never good enough. You always have to tell the ramifications. So not only do you say that, it appears that the neighbor is using a portion of your client, always appears without permission. You always want to tell the client that had this use continued long enough under the right conditions, it may have ripened into an easement or it could ripen into an easement and then suggest the client seek legal counsel if the client is concerned. I see lots of use that's adverse. And the client will say, well, what should I do? I said, listen, if it was my property, I wouldn't worry about it. Right, the old, you know, the corner of the property, you look up about uh, 15 feet in the air and there's a, a power line going from the utility pole, the ro road over to the neighbor's house and it cuts across the corner of your client's property 15 feet in the air. If that was my property, I wouldn't worry about it. Could care less, right? Wouldn't bother me. How about if the neighbor uh, had their paper box within the right of way, still on your property, cross the road on your property? Would I worry about that? No. So sometimes the client should even be concerned. And then there's always the, do you have enough money to fight this? Justice is not cheap. I, there was a case in Pennsylvania, I wasn't involved in it, where the, the parties to litigation were arguing over four square feet. And when it was all said and done, they would each spent close to 40,000, not four square feet, four square inches. They were arguing about a mailbox post. $40,000 for four square inches. Why can't I have clients that have that much money without the common sense. Those are the perfect clients for a lawyer, right? Clients with money and no common sense. All right, how should the surveyor label the adverse use? Just say possible adverse use, you don't know. Like I say, if there was permission given 100 years ago to start the use or 10 years ago, um, then it's never gonna be adverse use. And by the way, if they were related, if the servient estate and the dominant estate were related at the time the use began, the courts presumed there was permissive use. In other words, if a brother owning the back lot was crossing his sister's lot to get to it, at the very start when the road was built, 100 years later, it's presumed to have been permissive because of the close family relationship, the court presumes there was permission. Already answered this next one. The use has been maintained for decades and the surveyor has the absolute opinion that the use has ripened into an easement. Can the surveyor show the use as an easement? No. And I've answered the next one. And let me get the, this last point in, and then I see I'm just about out of time. Is the adverse use limited to type and area of use? Yes, as a general rule, yes. So if somebody uh, used a road, a road to harvest crops, They drove across the neighbor's land with a hay wagon, the farm equipment, and that that's all the use that can occur under prescription. You can't expand it then to include uh, development. And the width is the width that was used during prescriptive prescription. So if it was uh, used by an ATV, to get back there 
and they got 20 years of ATV use, and then they decide, well, they'd like to bring their Jeep Cherokee back there, too bad. The width is the prescriptive width, uh, easement is limited to the width used during the prescriptive period. And that's why I say as a surveyor, make sure you get that information. All right, Trent, I've um, used up the hour and I know some of those that are listening to me have other things they wanna do tonight. I thank you all for your attention. Um, turn this back over to Trent. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, anybody have specific questions they wanna to talk to Canute about? as it relates to uh, prescriptive easements or did I see, was there a hand raise or was it just a hand clap in there somewhere? Might have Where'd everybody go? <laughs> no just question? awesome stuff. Thanks, yeah. dude. Yeah, exactly. You're welcome. It's always good. It's always good having Canute on. Um, really good perspectives. And uh, I did, uh, like you said, share all the information in the Dropbox if you guys want it. Um, they'll be there. I'll do a follow-up as well and uh, follow-up email this week for Canute. So if nobody has anything to ask, then we'll let uh, Canute get back to his uh, extremely busy schedule. <laughs> Thanks, Trent. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Canute. Thanks, you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. See you, Trent. Thanks, everyone. See you, guys. See you, Danny.